Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's presentation, From Glider to Spinner, The Rotational Journey of Taryn Sig. My name is Dan McQuaid. You'll be hearing my voice today, as well as the voice of Coach Brian Bedard of Colorado State University. And also, you'll hear the voice of Roger Einbecker. Roger and I run the McThrows.com website, which is bringing you this presentation. Roger, are we going to hear the dogs today? No dogs. Disappointing. <laughs> quick a quick shout out to Rob Lasorza of MF Athletic. Rob is a great benefactor of the throwing events. Please contact him anytime you need throwing implements or any type of track and field equipment. A little background on us. As I said, we are McThrows.com, basically the little brother to the Mac Throw video site. We post articles about meets along with interviews and uh, with throwers and throws coaches. We also host webinars like this one. You can follow us on Twitter. Facebook, and Instagram. Our presenter today is Brian Bedard, the longtime head coach and throws coach at Colorado State University. Brian, the five-time Mountain West Conference Coach of the Year, has built a fantastic program at CSU. Among the many great athletes that Brian has coached are Casey Malone, NCAA discus champion and two-time Olympian. Lori Smith, an NCAA hammer champion and Olympian. Mustafa Hassan, two-time NCAA champion in the shot put indoors and a competitor at the last three world championships representing Egypt and Brian's own daughter, Kelsey, who became a second team NCAA All-American in the hammer, weight throw and discus. And Roger and I can attest both having raised a daughter that coaching your daughter could not have been an easy way to make a living for those four years. So that, that might make a great subject for a, a future webinar, how to survive coaching your child. That's, that's for sure. I have to get my wife on the line there too. <laughs> yeah, it can be like a family <laughs> therapy session. <laughs> hey, today now, we're going to ask Brian to focus on uh, one of his current athletes, Turn Sig. Turn put the shot 14 meters 19 as a high school glider. But she improved to 1744 by the end of her sophomore year in college after converting to the rotational technique. So Brian's going to share some insights into the often frustrating, but sometimes, as in the case of Taryn, rewarding process of making the glide to spin conversion. Brian, thanks for joining us today. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. I respect, uh, I, I love listening to your webinars and uh, especially with the extra time we have, it's uh, it's a good investment in time and to listen to all the other coaches and training philosophies and technique talk. And so it's just a valuable resource. So I'm, I'm uh, look forward to, to talking to you guys today and hopefully we can dig into some stuff at least. And I do have a disclaimer. I have not got it all figured out. Uh, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still a word. I'm still a work in progress in every aspect of my life and especially in coaching. Uh, my wife will attest that I'm still a work in progress here as a husband. Yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I, I think, and I've told people that if I, if I feel that I have got it all figured out um, and I found the way then I should probably retire. Um, and I heard Tom Pucks to say something similar to that, um, listening to him on a webinar recently. So I'm still learning and growing and learn a lot from the athletes too, as we kind of journey together, trying to figure this thing out and what works for them and what doesn't. So I'm still open to that, you know, getting feedback from them. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I've converted several athletes from the glide to the spin. And this is just kind of a um, specific journey with Taryn and what she's going through. I mean, we're not to the end of this thing. I mean, we've, we've gotten through her, um, we finished out her uh, outdoor season last year as a, as a redshirt sophomore. And then we got through her indoor season as a junior. Um, then the whole COVID thing happened at the NCAA championships while we were there. So that was, a um, unlike anything I've been through as a, as a coach going through that with her and all the other athletes there and coaches. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting journey, and I, I think it's one as a coach you say, you know, she was a glider in high school, and I'll, I'll show you in a little bit kind of her technique as a high school glider, which was not good. Um, but I've, I've been in a position with several athletes where we've made that conversion, and sometimes it's a leap of faith. But I, I like to think we 
had some logical steps along the way as, you know, looking at Taryn and kind of what she brought to the shot put and kind of what her gifts and talents were. And is, is the rotation going to be a good fit for her? Um, Cause with some athletes, sometimes it is the choice just to leave them alone. Um, I had another athlete um, a, couple, a year or two before Taryn came on board. Her name is Maria Musio. Her dad was a uh, Olympic uh, caliber decathlete, Rob Musio. Um, and he coached her in high school and she was a, uh, she was a glider. Um, she was right at a 45, 45 feet in the glide and had decent glide technique. And I made a decision to not convert her her first year at Colorado state. And then, uh, made the decision based on her foot speed and her vertical jump and her athleticism. She was also a volleyball player to switch the rotational shot. And Maria just threw, um, 53-3 at the conference indoor meet um, before her outdoor season was canceled. So I only had three years working with her and we went from a 45 foot glider to 53 feet and I kicked myself for probably not converting her earlier in her career her freshman year because uh, we lost a year kind of sticking with the glide and staying a little bit stuck with it because I, I think she threw 46 feet pretty consistently through her freshman year at CSU. And then we switched to her second year rotational shot and got her up to 49. And then in her third year uh, at CSU, she went 51. And then in her fourth year, she went 53-3. And then I think she probably would have went close to 54 feet in the outdoor season. But um, but how, how do you know as a coach to make that switch, guys? I mean – It's um, a hard choice, isn't it? A hard decision. It is. And – you know, I, I do look for, for foot speed and, and someone that's good on their feet and shows, you know, do they, can they throw the discus? Do they look comfortable rotating? Because some people are not comfortable rotating and they need to stick with the glide and they're, they more operate on a linear space well and they, you probably leave someone like that alone. Um, Lori Smith was a girl we, we switched. She was a 43-footer out of high school as a glider and and by the time we were done at CSU, she threw 56 feet as a rotator. I just, there's no way Lori Smith at five feet, six inches tall is going to throw 56 feet as a glider. Um, but she had, you know, very good feet, could rotate well. And it was just kind of an educated guess to make the switch. So with Taryn, I mean, we had a volleyball player that was 5'11 or six feet tall and 190 pounds. I watched her play volleyball in high school and, uh, I saw good feet. I saw her move well on the court, uh, good vertical jump, uh, athletic. Um, and, and I watched her discus technique in high school, although it looked rough. I mean, I saw she could turn. Um, and I also knew that, you know, she was a club volleyball player and spent the bulk of her time training club volleyball and probably only, you know, maybe two, two and a half months out of the, uh, out of a normal year, you know, training track. Uh, the rest of the time she was a, you know, serious volleyball player. So her, she looked technically rough in both the discus and shot, but it was what I was essentially recruiting and, and bringing in was uh, someone I thought was a good athlete, great body type, looked like a division one athlete. And I was going to hope and pray that she was coachable and we were going to make this, you know, big conversion to rotational shot. And she kind of bought into that philosophy and away we went. Brian, and it was you, just smooth, smooth sailing from there. No problems whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, just a linear path to success, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, no problems. <laughs> Brian, do you recall when she was throwing 14, 19 in high school, what her, what her stand throw was approximately? Well, that'd be a great question for her. I, I would assume she had a pretty decent stand throw. She's, she has a decent stand now. I, she was probably gaining a couple feet on her glide. So I would imagine she could throw, I don't know the metric on it, but probably 42 to 43 feet if she really got through one on a stand throw. Um, so she I, was I not assume. getting a huge conversion no. to her glide. No, no. Is that another no. reason why you thought maybe the rotation would be the way to go? Uh. I really didn't, you know, get any measurements on her um, stand throws to see, okay, what kind of conversion are we getting from the glide? I could see the glide and how how rough it looked and yeah. knew that she wasn't getting everything she could out of, out of her potential. So, again, it wasn't a hard choice. 
you know, I did hear, I'll be honest, I told Taryn this as a motivator. I heard from some coaches, some high school coaches. They said, oh, yeah, I see you've got Taryn C committed and signed. And and uh, they said, good luck with that. I was like, what's that supposed to mean? They said, well, I'm not sure how coachable she is. Um, her, her technique, you know, she's obviously a physical specimen, but we've looked at her technique and she's pretty rough. And I just don't know how coachable she is. And I said, well, in her defense, she hasn't spent a whole lot of time you know, training track and working on the technique because she's been so busy with volleyball. And uh, luckily, you know, she is, she has been coachable and easy to work with and we have a great rapport with each other and, and they were wrong, but you, know, you get a little concerned when you hear that. Yeah. Was it hard to get her away from volleyball? It was, it was, a, I think it was a tough decision for her. Um, volleyball is a little more glamorous and, you know, she did get some offers to play volleyball and, um, I'll be honest, I probably gave her a, a larger scholarship than she deserved based on her marks, but I kind of took a leap of faith knowing what her potential could be and just her, her physical tools she was bringing in. Um, and I, I just, you know, I talked to her volleyball coach and, and, uh, folks in the school and they said, she is just an absolute, you know, a uh, great competitor, extremely hard worker, very good leader. Um, so those are the kind of things, well, you can't, can't go wrong if you start putting those pieces together. You know, something's good. Good is going to happen, even with my coaching. <laughs> you were confident she could overcome your coaching. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, is it coincidental that uh, Taryn was a multi-sport athlete? And I think you said Maria was. I, I looked at a couple of your other more recent throwers. They, they all kind of have a – similar body type there's a I think a girl that's on your squad now Gabby McDonald who was a soccer player and and, and still is Gabby is our starting goalie at Colorado State um so, so is, that, is that a secret you got a secret here about uh you know uh athletes athletes that have the ability to compete at the collegiate level in multiple sports is that Boy, that's that's just something I've always liked. Um, I think it shows some versatility. I, I think I get a little bit concerned when I I'm recruiting an athlete that just does track and they train track year round and they have really good coaching and you know they're a part of the high school team and a club team and they they train year round. Great lifting program, really good coaching at the club program. I kind of wonder, you know, where are they going to go from here? They're I, res I respect the coaches they're working with and they look great technically already. And, um, you know, if you, if you sign an athlete like that, you're going to get what you, you get. You don't, uh, you know, I get concerned with how much better they're, they're going to get and are they burned out and some of those questions come into play. On the flip side of it, I mean, you get an athlete in that's, that's probably a little fresher and can concentrate more, you know, just on track and not have the other sports. Um, and they should have a, a, a pretty big bump in performance right away. Um, but the other thing you wonder is, you know, how coachable are they? Are they, you know, are they going to develop like you think? You, you have to make some calculated risks um, based on that because if it doesn't pan out, then, you know, it's not good. But, yeah, you're right. I, I, I do look for those athletes. I mean, my own daughter played basketball in high school, uh, had some D2 looks, you know, for basketball and um, – Tried to play volleyball like my wife and injured her ankle, and that was kind of it with that. But, uh, yeah, I think it is something I look at. Hey, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and stop share on my screen if you want to take yours over or take take the screen over to show uh, your film. And yeah, uh, we can maybe take a look at Taryn. I Let's see. I had my daughters train me up on this stuff. <laughs> they trained you well. Uh, well, well, we'll see if we can get in here. I have a, there, we go. there we go. So this, all these videos are essentially Taryn and I have some from uh, Jackson Morris demonstrating some of the videos because Taryn didn't demonstrate them well enough. So um, but let's go back high school. I believe this is, um, I'll turn it this way. 
Okay, yeah, that looks good. This is this is uh, I believe junior year high school. Um, our lovely glide technique here. I love I love the leg coming back behind. I hate yeah. that to be honest. Uh, the the, the, yeah, the left leg wrapping around. Coaches don't have your athletes do that. It's um, anyway. Hops up out of the back, so she doesn't unseat her hips at all. Hops up out of the back, does not come off the heel. A lot of air time. Lands tall. Transfers left. So she's out of contact with the ground with the with the right foot. So she's getting no help from her right leg, right hip. Um, her head moves off the shot very early, so she's separated from the shot. Um, never quite gets her right hips through before the ball. So that was her junior year. Senior, this is state meet. Sh you know, short glide, explosive. You can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty pretty short glide. Comes off the heel a little bit better, still driving up out of the back a bit. Gets her right under maybe a little bit better, but there's her power position. Her head's already off the ball. The ball's yeah. kind of floating in space. Um, attempts to turn the right better. Gets more squared up to the finish. <clears throat> smacks it. Gets vertical. Okay, reverse. And there's your winner. When, so, you were, when you were recruiting her, Brian, did you broach the subject of switching? Oh, I did. I just said, I think this is your future. And, but, and the reason I do that is I want to know, is this, is this person going to be in or not? Because yeah. if I have to con convince somebody, we're in trouble. And I, and I just I tell any athlete that we make the switch on, hey, it's going to get really bumpy. I said, so buckle your seatbelt, put your shoulder harness on. Because you're going to have some meets where we go in and we've trained well at practice and everything's going great. And then we get into a meet situation, they call your name up and you're under pressure and then you fall apart. And until we get, until we get your technique so dialed in where you feel comfortable and you can be an athlete and kind of go on autopilot, uh, it's going to get bumpy and it's going to be inconsistent. You're going to warm up well and hit some big throws and then it goes to the competition and all of a sudden we're not doing what we're supposed to do out of the back and we're falling in and maybe you're throwing the shot out of the sector. Maybe you're fouling throws. Maybe, you know, you're just all over the place. And that was really her story, her, her first year. And I did something that was probably dumb as a coach. Um, I, I said, Taryn, uh, we're in a tough situation as a team. We had an injury and we're, we're shorthanded on the women's throws. Um, I'm going to switch you to the rotational shot. And I, but we're going to compete you your freshman year and I need you to score for us. <laughs> so that was just a lot of things I loaded on her. Um, but she was on a large scholarship and that was kind of the expectation. That's what our team needed. It wasn't fair, but that's just kind of where we were at. And um, I was with her the whole, I said, it's not fair. We're putting you in that position, but we need your help. And uh, we got her to the point where I think she could have scored in conference, but you know, warming up, she throws, you know, couple throws out of bounds and then she did a safety throw and threw like 43 or 44 feet and didn't score for us. So that, that experiment failed. Um, and, and that's, that's my fault. Um, let's see here. This is, uh, this is just some basic things we were doing with Taryn. Um, cause she was a fouling machine. I mean, everything she did, I mean, she was, when we first switched the rotational shot, we did nothing, but, uh, kind of slow motion range throws and uh, we were not switching our feet. So then we, we start moving into, okay, how do we reverse? How do we do proper reverse mechanics? And these are just some of the basic drills. And this is boring stuff. People don't like doing this stuff, but if you're going to foul throws and you got to, I mean, you got to work on reversing properly. So you stay in. So when that's kind of where we're. A, sorry, Brian, when you say she was a fouling machine, was she going over the toe board or was she throwing out of oh, bounds? Yeah. Yes, everything. <laughs> well, I, Let's get the whole gamut covered. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a concrete pad we have, and the 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 concrete off to the left of the sector just took an absolute beating from her because uh, you know she would just throw onto the concrete constantly. So look what I've done. 
I put a Band-Aid on her technique. Have you guys noticed this? A little Tom Walsh here. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I've shifted that right foot back because she's so rotationally oriented and would always end up on the, the left sector line and just bomb and throws out of the left sector and just – I'm going to send her dad the bill for the concrete work. <laughs> she's put so many chips. She's hit that freaking pole right there. Um, so these are some things we've done to, you know, I said, hey, you like to rotate. You like to use your right leg. So we're actually going to uh, move your right foot back. And we did this some her, fre her freshman year and sophomore year uh, to allow her to get a little more rotation. Massive right sweep. Hey, I got her in the middle of the circle. That's a victory. She's actually a little blocked off on this one. But these are some range throws we're doing. And if you notice, there's a marker out in the middle of the sector that she mm -hmm. almost hits. I say, do not throw past it. We're going to throw at 75, 80%. We're going to plunk the shot right down the middle, and we're going to non-reverse. So we did a ton of this, this kind of thing. And she could handle it at slower speeds. Um, when we'd start going full blast, you know, the wheels would come off. So this is our first inner squad. She's warming up here, and this this is a lot of what we saw, you know. This was right before the start of the indoor season. So a lot of control issues, body awareness issues. So um, in this throw, she has more of the traditional setup at the back, right? She does, yeah. We, we were we – were, I was still trying to fight it and not, not put a Band-Aid on it. She – she has kind of a trailing right leg. She does a weird lifting of the right leg right there, kind of late, hops up, which causes some problems, throws open big time, separates from the ball with her head, um, not standing through her block leg, um, and then reverse mechanics are an issue. So. so at what point did you start playing with the Tom Walsh setup? Uh, we did it quite a bit her freshman year, putting it, uh, and unfortunately, let's see. This was this was outdoor outdoor her freshman year. A after my boondoggle um, of competing her indoors and that, not having that turn out, we decided to redshirt her outdoors, and this is um, one of the meets outdoors. She's starting to get a little more refined, a little better over her left. Still has a massive massive right sweep i really promote coming out of the back having a low shin angle on that left leg mm -hmm. i don't know if you see that if you take a measurement from the ground to the to the left knee or to the shin i want that pretty low to the ground mm -hmm. the reason i think that's important when you go to sprint off the back that sets your drive angle if you have a high high knee high shin angle you're going to drive up out of the back and the problem with a young thrower, if you're going to drive up out of the back, you're going to step down to the middle and you're going to shift to your left leg. And we're, I'm trying to have her land with depth. Again, once she comes off the back, does not pinch her knees very well. So those knees stay a little bit wide. See the gap between her knees. So it makes for a slow left. It should be coming down at this point. She's got a really high left foot position. It takes a while to come down. And that whole time she's kind of opening with her upper body. So there's your power position. So, so turn, can I big vertical turn the right well, big vertical lift, smacks it well, reverse mechanics getting better. But Roger wants to say something. I hear you. Yeah, I just I, I thought maybe you had finished your point there. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to make a uh, just a question. You can leave it here on the range throws that you showed a slide or two ago. Were, yeah. were those were those specifically for Taryn to get the idea to throw under control? Or, or would she just want to go out and blast them every time? Or was, was there something else you were trying to impart to her by? Well, we do, a, we do a lot of range throws, especially when I'm introducing new, you know, new technique and stuff. Um, I break down the throw a lot. So we're doing stand throws, um, wheels or half turns, and then um, full throws. But a lot of the full throws we're taking, especially early on or in the fall, or if I'm introducing new technique or we're changing from glide to rotation, we could slow that down to maybe 60%. 60%. We're almost doing walking, walking turns, and we may break it down. Okay, entry mechanics to the middle, and then middle to the power position, and then we'll kind of piece it together and get one, one fluid movement, but it's still slow. 
and on balance, trying to hit a good power position. And then we move into actual throwing. I still have you going at 60 to 70%. And I'll say, I don't care how far the shot goes. I'm just worried about, you know, I just want to see you hit positions, be on balance, have a good rhythm, um, line up the finish. Let's throw down the center of the sector. You know, simple things like that. Do not throw past the marker we have out there. And that's to keep them under control. Mustafa didn't know how to do that when he came in. It was full blast all the time. And I said, dude, we can't, we can't work on concepts that way. So I had to slow him down and teach him how to do range throws. And I said, well, I want to give you, you know, time during practice, you know, at certain days of the week where I want you to, we're going to have some competitive efforts, but that can't be the bulk of your work. Um, we were going to have to slow it down so you can actually feel some things and I can coach stuff and we can build your kinesthetic awareness. Um, so yeah, that was for her benefit and for my sanity because she kept throwing onto the concrete. Okay. And <laughs> so I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Brian, could I interject with another question? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm on a roll. No, go ahead. You are on a roll. Um, so, so Taryn comes to campus. It's time to begin the yeah. fall of her uh, freshman year. It's time to begin the process, right? Yes. What, what, would, what would a typical shot put throwing session look like her first couple weeks on campus with you? What would that consist of? It would look like this, and I don't have any good video of her, but just starting from the basics, we do a ton of med ball stuff um, in the fall or late summer. So this is Jackson demonstrating a movement. Um, this is a cue. He's just doing a stand throw. And one thing I like when you have to hold the ball here, you push it back under pressure and you kind of load the shoulder a little bit, and create some stretch in the shoulder. Um, but you also take the left arm and left side out of the equation. So for all these guys that love to use their left arm, left side on entry and to, to initiate the finish or whatever, this, I really like some of these drills because you can't do it. And this one specifically, we're using a cue where we're, he's going to wait for left foot contact before we initiate the finish. So we're establishing that ta-ta while we're waiting for the left foot to come down. And now he's going to initiate the finish. And we should see his right foot turn right knee turn, hopefully ahead of the ball, and then the delivery, and hopefully get squared up on the finish. And we do all this um, not switching the feet, so no reverse. Um, this one was just a basic stand throw without the left foot touching down, but oh, now he's doing it again, yeah. Left foot down. So again, we should see right foot turn, right knee, right hip, then the ball. So just super basic stuff. Now we'd move into a half turn or a wheel. And the difference when I teach these, I want that ball back under pressure. I want you to take the left hand, the non-throwing arm, and I want you to push the ball back so the shoulder's under stretch. And I want your torso to be under stretch or under tension. And I want you to hold that tension until left foot contact. That's, that's your job with the upper body. Keep your head under control. Do not initiate the start of this movement with the upper body. I see so many guys do wheels or half turns or whatever you want to call them, and they initiate the upper body and essentially drag the legs behind, and that is a failed attempt in my opinion. I want to see upper body hold tension, and I want to see you move the legs. So he should punch off this left, pinch the knees, which he does a great job there, and we get left foot down, and hopefully that ball will, should be back on from this – view we're looking at if he drops the ball it'd be off his right heel that's exactly what i want and then from here i should see his right foot turn right knee turn ahead of the ball and then the right right hip comes through and the ball last block on the left side does that what's make sense weight, to you guys what's the weight of that ball uh that's probably a he's a skinny weak kid <laughs> don't tell jackson i said that uh, that's probably a 5K ball. Uh, with the guys, we'll do 5K, 6K. Um, with the women, three, four, five, depending on strength levels and what we're trying to do on the day. Uh, then we'd, we'd move into the full throw, same concept. Again, love this drill. I do this with my discus throws too. We've taken the left arm out of the equation because you got to push back on the ball and keep tension on that side. So he's still got to fight to get over his left. We still need to get his left armpit over left knee, left foot. 
open that left side together in unison. Big right sweep. And I want to see a punch and pinch off the left. I don't want to see full extension on the left. I want to see the left knee move in and down towards the middle, setting that low shin angle. Right sweep. And he's going to go off the left without full extension. Because if that left, in my opinion, gets fully extended, then it's a slow, long lever to get down at the front of the circle. And you're going to have to wait on it. Pinch the knees well. Now he's, going to, he's still waiting with his upper body to unwind. We're still holding that, that upper body tension until left foot contact. Now we can have the right foot turn, right knee turn, hip, ball. So Taryn did a ton of these, just trying to understand basic throwing concepts. So when she arrived on campus, job one was to get her to feel some positions using the metal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then posture stuff. You know, I'm a freak with posture because if you have a posture breakdown, you lose power. Um, hip engagement's a big thing with us. Triple extension's big. Um, leading with the hip. I mean, all that stuff. Hey, uh, on, that, on that slide right there where you've got multiple views, uh, yeah. Jackson, who we just watched, is starting in a kind of a crouched position. Right. Karen, uh, her freshman year, just to the upper left of there, is in a crouched position. But to the right, Karen's a little more upright at the back. Yep. Is there a... Is there a rationale for how, how they start, how you want them, and or how they evolve? Yeah, some of that was uh, Taryn's idea, to be honest. Um, we had her in a fairly low start position and uh, trying to get her over the left, and, and she said, can I start a little bit higher and work on dropping into my left a little bit? And I said, well, we'll see how it goes, um, but I'm, I'm willing to try anything. And if an athlete believes in it and buys into it, then, and it creates more consistency, then I'm willing to take a look at it. This, so this is her freshman year outdoors. Um, she does get, and I think Roger brought this up last time we kind of reviewed some of the videos. She does get it maybe an abnormally high right leg out of the back um, and kind of leans in a little bit as she comes in. But uh so I'm not a, not a fan of that, but that's what she does. Um, to the point where we're, this was, let's see. Should have been again, outdoors her freshman year. So that movement's getting better. You know, her con control's getting better, getting more comfortable. And I started thinking about now, hey, it looks like I made a pretty good decision in the recruiting process. I got someone in here that's that's pretty special. And then and then she brings me back to reality when I see stuff like this. So <laughs> it keeps, she's gonna be so happy, happy to see this on YouTube. Smiling. Oh, well, and she's got some other ones that I filmed and I actually posted it on my Instagram, some of her crashes. I said, hey. If we're going to put your good stuff on there, we got to have the, the, you know, the stuff where you're not doing so well. Um, if it wasn't in a this, meet, you could call it an outtake. That's right. That's right. This is, uh, again, some experimentation. This is freshman year, outdoor season, fairly early meet here. Pretty big lean in, off the back, falls in a bit. Good enough. She, she's not going to be, she kind of fell in. And the problem is when an athlete falls to the middle and has to catch their fall, that right leg is not going to be able to be active for a bit. You're going to have a pause there and a delay while you have to restabilize before you can get that, that right side going again. That, that's, she, the part, that's the part of Walsh's throw you got to get. Uh... Yep. So there's that. Um, let's see here. We watch that. So then we, we kind of progress to uh, this was last year at the uh, NCAA first round meet. 
No, she is in. Um, she's currently in. She she has struggled throughout the season. Um, the indoor championships in, in uh, the Mountain West Conference. She waited till her last throw. She PR'd like three times in the Mountain West Conference Championship. Then on her last throw, she moved from second to first and threw a lifetime best by three feet, qualified for the NCAA Championships. Okay. So she is a, a really good competitor, uh, especially on the last throw when, when it counts. So we, we think we have things pretty well dialed in because through 56 feet at the Mountain West Conference Championships as, as a redshirt freshman, goes to nationals, does pretty well there, throws 50, I think 53 feet, was the second team All-American. And we think things are going to smooth out when we go to the outdoor season. But she has a very erratic outdoor season, still all over the place, still fouling throws, still putting throws out of the left sector, still not getting over her left out of the back. Uh, we go to the NCAA first round meet. You have to be in the top 12 to advance to – to the nationals and um she's not even in the last flight of the best throwers she's in this this i think uh the third flight and there's four flights so she's not even in that last flight so she's you know she's she's got to have a big throw on her, on her last throw because um her first two throws were in the 51 52 foot range so she makes the decision i'm going to just go for it on my last throw and when, what I love about her is Taryn, when she commits, um, she's going to go for it. And that may mean she closes her eyes and just, and just flat out goes for it. And she may crash and burn, but she's willing to take that chance. And a lot of athletes are not willing to do that. So that's what she does on this last throw. She goes for it. I'll show you full speed. And hits a lifetime best. Throws it over 57 feet and has the longest throw of the NCAA first round. She beats everybody there. That's fantastic. Uh, and the, cr the crowd at that point, saw, and they were just like, what just happened? Oh. 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 All right. Because um, it was kind of out of nowhere. But again, it shows you the potential. So let's look at what she did well and what she didn't do well. Um, I got the Tom Walsh start, you know, we've, and it's not because, hey, uh, she's got a gifted right leg and we want to give her more energy. We're still trying to put a Band-Aid on, you know, not throwing out of the left sector and not breaking up my concrete. So we've got her right leg started back. She's excited, doesn't do a great job getting over her left, so she cuts the corner off a bit. Drives off the back late. I mean, we're in trouble at this point. Look where she landed. Yeah. She's outside the left side of the board. We're in trouble. I'm worried about, is she going to stay in or is she going to foul this thing? Um, she's got the shot back pretty well. She did a pretty good job of staying disciplined. And, man, we're fighting. You know, she's, she's always led with her head back to the glide days, pulling her head off the ball. She's fighting to keep her eyes back on a focal point back here to hold her head in place. Just come off the focal point. But that's her power position. That's pretty good for her. If you can see that ball on the, on, off her right heel behind her hip a little bit, we're in pretty good shape. Bam, turn the right leg, get the hip through, big vertical lift. Now, are we going to stay in on this with a big vertical lift, chase the ball, just got the edge of the toe board, fight to stay in, big PR. All right. So oh, wow. here's a oh, whole hum. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. I mean, you come from being, I, I don't know what she was ranked going in to that meet, um, fairly low because she hadn't hit a great outdoor mark. Now she goes into the NCA with her mark at 57 feet, and she's potentially, I think she's ranked third or fourth going into the NCA championships. So there's a completely different set of expectations that's put on her. She, she didn't have any there. I mean, she's, I'm not going to the NCAAs unless I go nuts and just get after it here. Yeah. Now she's a player. I mean, she's, she's ranked in the top three or four in the NCAAs. I got a chance to do something, get, get on the award stand, and – so all of a sudden that whole mental dynamic changes because now you're in the mix. And as a young thrower, that's tough, you know, to go from 
no expectations to a backpack full of expectations because you know you just hit a huge throw and we've seen what you're capable of but are you ready to can you repeat that again and again and can you repeat that at the NCAA championship level when the stakes are higher and the pressure is higher and she struggled with that so again the, the process the whole learning process not just technique right coaches I mean it's, yeah. it's the mental development too yep so that so then now we're into the uh, indoor season, this, this past indoor season, and then you, you throw into there a, a sore elbow. So she lost about three to four weeks, probably four weeks of training with a, a sore elbow and a sore back and some limited training there and, and um, trying to stay off the panic button. Do we redshirt the girl or not? And, hey, we need her to try to win a conference title. And um, let's see, where's her conference we throw? Oh, it's this one. Oh, here we go. So we we finally are starting to do some pretty good things right before conference, and uh, but she's got a teammate that's, that's throwing well too, and Maria leads leads off with a a lifetime best over fifty three feet, and and Taryn is is doing some good things in the circle, but it hasn't quite lined one up. But just kind of just really worked on our mental focus and staying calm and staying coachable. And I just saw from throw to throw, um, she was just being really coachable and, and, and calm and collected. And, and she could come over and tell me, hey, you know, I did this pretty well on this throw, um, I, but I missed the finish or I did this pretty well, but I didn't do that. She said, it's close. It's really close. I can feel it. And then uh, this is what happened on her last throw. Hold it. So she wins the meet on, oh, here we go. The meet on this throw and has a, a season best and throws over 56 feet and qualifies for national. Did not get over her left very well. If I had criticism, boy, I'd like to see her get her uh, armpit over her left knee. and said she cut the corner a little bit. Big right sweep. And, and I, I talked to you guys about this the last time we reviewed the video. Um, I get a little concerned about how high she is on that left foot, but it doesn't look too bad there. This left foot position is a little bit high and, and not super stable. Lands pretty well in the middle. I, I always talk about big big right sweep, and then we're gonna have the lower leg move under, move under the knee, and I want the foot dorsiflex, which I think she does a pretty good job here. There's a little step down right at the end. Pinches the knees pretty well there. Now we're doing everything we can to keep the left arm long, eyes back at the back, and just trying to hold, keep that torso tension intact, and, and, and just leave the ball back behind the hip, get that foot down. Now in this position, she's a little blocked off, but I'd rather have her blocked off than open because she lo loves throwing out of the left sector line. And I do see the ball uh, off the right heel, so it's behind the right heel, which is good. That gives her a chance to keep the hip in front. And what I want my athletes to do, I want the process to be rotate and lift. So I want to see the, keep the body weight back over the right as long as possible. And I want to see rotation and then lift through the ball. You get a big lift and that okay reverse. I'd like to see a longer left because that helps slow down. If we have that nice long left leg, it helps slow rotational speed and act as a nice counterbalance to keep us in the circle. It's kind of half committed. But she did a nice job of lowering her center when she lands here, which gives you a better chance of staying in, I think. So that's where we were at conference. But, I mean, not everything works out as you'd hoped. I mean, we were hoping she'd be, you know, throwing 57, 58 feet by that point. But because of the, the injury, um, you know, we were behind about three to four weeks. So now but we've qualified for nationals and uh, we're getting ready for nationals. And then some of her, let's see, some of her training throws before nationals, you know, I, I think we're doing a pretty, pretty good job with some stuff here. And again, we're back to some range throws, just work on good solid movement. And she's cruising some easy throws at 50, Fantastic. 50, 57 feet here. Um, I mean, that's just, well, I like that. She really looks different. I mean, that's remarkable how, how much comfort she developed in those two years. Doing a yeah, much better job getting out over the left, on balance, 
lands to the middle. Still likes opening that left arm pretty early. Squares up on the finish better. There was times in her first year, gentlemen, that, that rinky-dinky cage I have around our shot area there. Mm -hmm. uh, she would get so discombobulated in the circle, she would throw over the top of that cage and throw it onto our track out there on the, on the curve there. Wow. I, I kid you not. This is the shot. This isn't the weight. So there may be a practice where she lines one up and hits 50 to 52 feet. Next throw, gets excited, unwinds, miss uh, her feet are out of position, over rotate, jacks it over the cage, and we got athletes scrambling to get out of the way. <laughs> I've never had a shot putter put over the cage. And, and how next, did you – next? I mean, next throw pretty good, and or next throw in the right cage. Next throw, jacks went over the cage again. I kid you not. And how, how did you manage – her mentally there i mean that had to be embarrassing right nobody likes to be embarrassed did she ever say to you i hate the, the rotation i hate you for suggesting it i'm out of here well i i just said uh i might have said you've got to be shitting me right <laughs> i said i've never had anybody i said but hey look at the potential i mean who has the power and the lift get over the cage and i said it was a far throw just in the wrong direction i said if i ever get you lined up you're going to be scary um, so we had to laugh about some of that stuff and, and luckily she can laugh at herself, which, which I think is really valuable for athletes to be able to, you know, cr crash and burn, dust themselves off, have a laugh with teammates and all right, let's go and do it again. I, I just think there's a, you know, it's healthy for an athlete to be able to do that and she could always do that. Um, would you say there's a, there's a certain mental makeup that it takes to, to withstand the ups and downs of the transition like she was going through absolutely absolutely and i've seen coaches try it with certain athletes and maybe the athlete wasn't fully committed or especially at the high school level and you know head coaches want you to score points and hey they were a consistent scorer as a glider and all of a sudden they're not and or you know the athlete says geez coach maybe i should just do a glide and score points and then i'll go back to rotation when i'm in the finals and they just keep vacillating back and forth and trying to and i just you got to fully commit in my opinion or not um if there's just going back and forth to score and you know every time you get on the panic button um luckily you know there was enough highlights and and far throws sprinkled in there that it keeps you going because man you see your potential, and the coach gets excited about it, and the athletes get ex excited about it. Now we just got to work on consistency and awareness and kind of where you're at in the circle. And, you know, that's my job to help with that. But you start seeing some big throws, maybe you pull a tape measure out. Do you realize how far this went? Well, I fouled it. Yeah, but it went really far. If we can work on your reverse mechanics, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out. But Or, hey, I went really far, but, yeah, I was out of the right, you know, I was out of the left sector, you know. Um, so I think I have a two. This, this, this is this is a freshman year. Uh, yeah, this is fifty-two at. feet. <laughs> fifty-two feet, but I mean, over rotate uh, out of back. But you can you're see at. the potential. So that's and, why uh, you started experimenting with the wall start. Absolutely, to balance her out a little bit. Yeah, one to put a band aid on it, and two, and you know, it, it shows, it shows potential there, man. It, oh, I, I lost you. Are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. We, I think, um, the screen share dropped. Yeah, I got a call right in the middle, but uh, you're an important guy. You, you got to take your calls. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you hit share screen again, I think you'll, you'll take it back oh. over. So, so, Brian, I. It's, um, I, I, you know, as I watch her, she's so good in her rotations. You know, she's almost, uh, that I, should, I should say that differently. Athletes who, who begin the rotational thing, uh, the, typically the miss isn't staying in the rotation too long. It's firing early, under rotating out of the back. She's just the opposite of that. She stays in her rotations forever. Yeah, that is true. And, and I've always so, kind of been of the opinion that the, the, you know, you watch the big guy throws, a lot of them are down the left. These guys are on the ball for a long time. Boy, she, and that, 
that throw you just showed us is, you know, kind of a carbon copy of a lot of those throws. It's, it's something she just seems prone to do uh, just because it must feel like the right thing to her. Maybe I've showed her too much of um, uh, Krauser because, uh, you know, he'll ride for a long time and, and sometimes even rover rotate or get his left outside the, the toe board. And I love what Ryan Krauser does. So he's, you know, I obviously send, send a lot of videos to her. And Maggie Ewan, I've sent a lot of her footage to, to Taryn. Um, one, I think they have a connection. I mean, Maggie was a volleyball player, and I, I recruited Maggie and know her well, and I, but I like some of the stuff she does and similar body types and that sort of thing. Can, before I forget to ask, can you talk just briefly? Uh, uh, there's two things, I guess. The is was the back injury that you mentioned that she was kind of going through elbow in the back. Was that was that throwing related, or might have that have been uh, weight room stuff? Uh, I think it's volleyball related. Unfortunately, with as much volleyball she did play, she had some lingering stuff st still giving her some grief. So some of that back stuff she brought in with her, and that's you know. When you recruit athletes from other sports, heck, you can get it, you know, if they overtrain or just the amount of jumping and stuff. So that's something we're going to have to continue to deal with with her career. The uh, elbow we did have scoped. There was um, there was something in there that we, we cleaned out, and she's in good shape now and can start, start training again. So I was probably going to sit her down this outdoor season anyway with, with as much uh, grief as her elbow was giving her. So. Um, was that throwing related? I don't know. Um, maybe the elbow was. I don't think the back was. I think it was more probably volleyball related. And she's been on a completely different program than some of the other athletes I got anyway, just because some of the, the stuff she brought in with her back. So um, our strength coach has been really creative with, with her training. Can you give us an example of a way he's adapted her workouts? Uh, well, we're not loading her up with any heavy back squats, that for sure. So we're, we're staying away from, you know, spinal loading. Um, so we've done, you know, pit shark, uh, some hip sled work, um, single leg, you know, step ups and things like that. So we're, uh, we're just not going as heavy doing the, the loading through the spine, which has helped out a lot. Um. But you know her strength levels aren't off the charts. Um, but if I if I have her run, we do some stadium stair, time stadium stair sprints. And I don't know about anybody else, but if I if I line our guys up and I have them um, hit the first step and and start the clock until they touch the wall at the top, we do. And I have no idea the distance or anything like that, but I can get a really good look at how someone moves up the stairs and what kind of horsepower they have and what kind of foot speed they have. And I think it's, I think there's a lot to be said. There's a really good correlation with speed and power and, and uh, how well that's going to convert to the throws. Cause some of the best ones climbing, you know, sprinting up the stadium stairs have been some of my best throwers. And I don't think that's an accident. Even Mustafa, he could haul the freight get <laughs> at, you know, 308 pounds that dude could move. He's got great feet, so. Hey, Brian, I'd like to go back a little bit to the process of uh, you bet. converting Taryn. So, so when she got on campus, you spent a lot of time with her doing those med ball drills to establish some positions. Yep. And then did you continue with those drills for the whole year, or how did you, how did you, how did that play out? Yeah, a lot of them through the fall. And, and we also did some other med ball stuff, but those were a key part. We we're probably doing those at least two days a week, sometimes three days a week, early fall. And then we start transitioning into the, the actual implement. So we're, we'd be doing a lot of stand throws, with posture, mechanics, um, a lot of non-reverse work initially. I really think it's important for the athlete to, to do a heavy dose of non-reverse stuff. I'm a huge proponent of the athlete feeling the ground, working the ground, working the right, um, feeling that connection to the ground, up through that kinematic chain, through your body, in through the system, 
to release the implement. I just really think it's important. Even if they're going to be a reverser for me, I just think it's very important to establish that connection with the ground. Yeah, we're, and it's really important posture, contact with the ground, you know, right, right foot turning relation with the ground. Um, on the pivot turn itself, the reason I like this drill is it, it uh, sets the shin angle, we get a punch off the left, we close the knees, and we're just working on upper body patience. It's just, this drill is really tough to do well, but I think it's critical. And some may say, well, it doesn't transfer the throw as much as you think, and I, but from a conceptual standpoint and getting athletes to focus on certain aspects of the throw, I really like this drill if, if it's done well. Um, the problem is not many people do it well. Um, so, but we, we just keep incorporating, I mean, we keep breaking down the throw, we keep doing uh, stand throw mechanics. Um, sometimes we do some South African if I have an athlete that needs to work on sprinting off the back if they're, they, they rotate maybe too much and they don't know when and where to drive off the back. I, I, I do advocate a sprint off the back. But you can't sprint off the back until the right leg passes the left. I mean, it's impossible. So, um, you know, it, and maybe I'd, I'd be criticized a little bit with her, her right leg, Taryn's right leg out of the back, and that may be up for debate. Is her right leg too too high? And are you sure you want to be, you know, to do that? Because Mustafa's, Mustafa's uh, uh, movement is completely different. Um, if you look at this gun, let's see. Where is he throwing there? Oh yeah, do you like this? It's interesting. He this looks like a war zone or something. It, it's some construction site that he found. So he made this ring himself, and he, he bought some some weights, and he's doing this all on. I mean, but yeah, this is a kind of a rough area. Wow. So that's recently during the, like the, uh, Oh yeah. Lockdown? This is uh June 2nd. Wow. But if you, if you look at his right leg action, you have, it's, it's fairly, look how high his right foot is and it's yeah. trailing behind. I'm not a huge fan of that. And we've kind of gone round and round about it. We had other issues we were working on. This is what he brought in with himself and that we just, we're kind of been dealing with it. So I prefer to have more of a Krauser, big right leg, uh, inside of the right leg lead, uh, and not have this lower leg drag. But I've also seen a lot of international throwers throw far doing this in the discus on the shot. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I have encouraged him to do is to get it out at this point, get it out away from him at this point, and then let the knee move up and the foot move under the knee and that sort of thing. So I think he does that pretty well. I'd love to see him hold his foot dorsiflexion longer. I think he reaches down at the circle and kind of looks for the ground. And I'd rather see him hold that right foot dorsifoot flexion into the ground. Uh, he comes off the left, and I think he pinches the knees okay here. I like that. I see his right, his right elbow is setting up a nice high point here, left shoulder down. That's supposed to happen. Um, let's see how – there's his power position. That's not too bad for him. We've really been working on this. Usually he lands like wide open. So this is pretty good patience for him. He's trying to see the back, back of the circle. He's kind of got his right eye looking back. Um, he's trying to keep his left arm under control because usually he throws open. Now we should see right leg action. Yeah, right, right foot, right hip, right knee, turn in front of the ball and hopefully square up to the finish. Um, reverse towards the board. I think he's getting his heel towards the board a little bit too much. I like to see him land sideways to the throw, but that's getting nitpicky. And then he's got to go dig his shot out of the garbage over there. <laughs> Is he helping demolish that building? Uh, he hasn't hit the wall yet. I've watched a lot of those, and he hasn't hit the wall yet. But uh... So, Coach, you've got two athletes who spent, have spent a lot of time with you who look different technically. Can you talk about why that is? Uh, inconsistent coaching would be, 
Well, again, Mustafa brought that right leg in with him, and we had other issues in his throw that we had to get rid of. He's extremely rotational, extremely left-sided in his finish, and everything he did did not stay on the ground, work his right side at all, did not square up to the finish, split with the implement constantly. So that was really our push. And I, I'll be honest, I kind of let the right leg go. We tried it. We put the cones out, and then we were in the competitive season, and it was all over. Taryn, we put the cones out, and we her right leg's a little bit lower here, and I actually like this movement quite a bit. This was taught from from the start, and I, you know I'm I'm more comfortable with what she's doing here, getting over the left, big right sweep. But is she, is, in that in that throw is she slightly loading on the left in the back? It looks a little bit like she is. She's kind of. Got that right she, leg. Go ahead. Is she is she cheating over to the left a little bit yeah. on the start? Yeah. Yeah, and that's okay with me, because she's had so much difficulty doing that. She's uh she's intentionally trying to may, maybe hold a little more weight here on it, uh -huh. and uh, it enables her to get on top because in competition when they call her name up and she gets revved up, is she going to be patient enough to to get over the left? Um, or is she going to cut the corner off? Well, history shows us she cuts the corner off and, and misses misses the start a little bit. But pretty good stuff right there, I think. Yeah. We're on the right track. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, that's a good question. Mustafa brought some stuff in with him. I, I said, you know, who was, who was working with you um, from a coaching standpoint back in Egypt? And he said, you know what he said? YouTube. What? <laughs> His YouTube. coach was YouTube. <laughs> yeah, he 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 had some co he had some coaches uh, helping him out with strength development, but he he didn't have uh, a whole lot of technical coaching. So a lot of it was learned on his own, and a lot of what he brought in with. Is it easier to coach an athlete who as who has comes to you with some habits, or one that you start with scratch? from from scratch with like uh Taryn? um i'd like to start from scratch because untraining old habits bad habits can uh can be a real nightmare um unless they have really good coaching i mean i'll be honest you know jackson's dad did a coached him in high school and you know he's got some some really good habits coming in so with Jackson's issue, it's just different. I mean, he's he's a kid that's behind from a strength development standpoint. We, he needs to mature physically. I mean, he's a jab guy too, so we're not going to get him too big. He's got to stay flexible and mobile and all that. But um, he just needs to mature physically. I don't think he's hit puberty yet. Got no facial hair and all. <laughs> so that was a joke, guys. Um, <laughs> I felt bad for Jackson. <laughs> yeah, he, I talk to him like that all day. But, yeah, I mean, he's just got to mature physically. and uh, But he's come in with a really good foundation technically, and his dad did a good job with him. And so that's good. I mean, every athlete has their, you know, issues that we're working on. And um, so that's where we're at. Coach, if you don't mind, I would just like to go back and sum up a little bit. For those who, you know, and I suppose probably every throwing coach is going to deal with this at some point if they haven't of trying to decide, okay, do I take this glider and make them a spinner? You'd yeah. say one important thing is that you got to sit down with the athlete and tell them, if we go down this path, we're not switching back and forth. That's important. Absolutely. Got to be committed at whatever level because there will be that temptation when things get rough um, to say, well, you know, I can make the finals if I glide or I can score points for the team if I go back and glide. And there'll just be this temptation from the coach or the athlete to go back and, and, and get the points. or Because they'll be in, in a tough situation where they're potentially going to foul out of a meet uh, or not foul out, but well, maybe so if they're that mm -hmm. inconsistent or, or they may not make a final because they just are not dialed in technically, but you just got to stay the course. And, I mean, there's going to be a lot of bumps, and uh, you just have to weather those. And I think what keeps you going is you, you line one up and connect on it, and, and sometimes it's by accident, and you see it go, and you say, well, wow, 
there is a lot of potential in this and that excitement from hitting those occasionally really keeps you going. Now, how do I find that more often? You know, how, how do I become more consistent with that? That's the challenge. Hey, uh, Brian, I looked at your top 20 lists and Taryn is on, uh, on, on everything and high on everything. How do yeah. you, how do you balance the other events against, against the shot, which I, I'm, I'm guessing we would think for the moment is where she's got the biggest potential, but she's got, got impressive marks and everything. Those, those take time too. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question because I not only, um, made the switch with her from glide to rotation, but we're also learning some new events, completely revamping her discus, uh, teaching her the weight throw and the hammer, um, which she has quite a bit of potential in there. Um, so yeah, how do you manage all that? And, and some coaches would say, hey, you've, and maybe rightfully so, maybe you've spread her too thin um, and got her doing too much. One, she's very team oriented and wants to help out the team as much as possible. And if she sees an opportunity where she can score for us and help us win championships, she wants to do that. Um, but I need to do a good job of making sure um, that her best event is going to be taken care of. And I, I really only train, have our shot putters throw three days a week anyway. I'm just really concerned about hand health, wrist health. Um, so I... I watch the number of throws they're taking per week and I watch how often we're throwing. We typically do not throw shot back to back days. Um, we usually put a day of recovery in between and, um, and maybe some coaches think that's crazy and you could develop your athletes more than that. But I just, I, I don't need hand issues and wrist issues. And, um, I inherited an athlete with a wrist issue and we could never really get rid of it throughout his career. Um, so there's just a protocol that I've, I've been doing that, that works. So if we got off days and I'm only throwing her, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, or whatever it might be, and she's got to be doing something on Tuesday, Thursday anyway. Um, so we may do a combo day with, uh, with discus or discus hammer, um, and mix those in, but she's still, she's still going to get the bulk of her work done with the shot. And that's going to be our priority. She's just that talented that she picks things up pretty quickly. So even with minimal training, she's thrown over 190 feet in the, in the hammer. And I don't know what she threw in the weight, maybe 64 feet in the weight. And, um, and with a javelin, very minimal work with a javelin. And she went out and, you know, actually helped to score in conference in the jab. Um, and she actually has quite a bit of potential there. But, you know, with elbow issues and stuff like that, you got to worry about keeping her healthy too. Can't get too greedy, right? Well, you, you, you're in the fortunate position of having someone that can be good in all those things. That's a, that's a rarity. Yeah. I mean, and she sees uh, Maggie Ewan and everything she did and, you know, she was a multiple event scorer and went to nationals and multiple events. And we've had some other athletes that have done that too. And um, I think, if she can help the team and, and she can be successful, she's going to want to do it. But, yeah, I, I think the shot obviously stands out as far as – because I really think she can be an 18-meter shot putter. I think we were getting fairly close to that before we had to shut things down with, with COVID. And I, I, I just think, uh, you know, that's the direction we're going to be going. She's, she's pretty limitless. If I can keep her healthy and headed in the right direction and um, – keep her from throwing over the top of the cage will be set <laughs> coach before we let you go could you give us one final piece of advice for someone who's going to embark upon this journey the conversion the, the glide to spin conversion yeah and i talked to taryn about this and, and i said you know uh, give me some some of your thoughts on the whole process and she said well i wasn't patient enough um and she hates the word, you know, because I always tell her, hey, she's so demanding on herself and wants to be really good and, and wants to be good now. 
a lot of young athletes want that microwave success, you know. Um, and she she was used to being winning everything in high school, and then all of a sudden you go off to college, and we start changing things up, and maybe you're not successful right away, or you're not winning, or you're going through some struggles, and um, that that can be tough when an athlete's used to being very successful and winning. So and. So her fuse was pretty short with lack of success. And, you know, she said, as much as you try to preach at me that, hey, this is a process and celebrate the little victories and the, the technical breakthroughs. And um, when she wasn't seeing results, I mean, she was kind of hard on herself. And she said, if I you know, had to do it over again or offer some advice is just stay in the process and know you're in for, for a long haul. I said, well, I didn't, I didn't help that process either when I threw you in the mix and told you, you know, we were switching the rotational shot and I need you to help us score in a conference. I mean, that puts some added pressure on you. And if I just said we're going to be redshirting you and sit you down and take this slower, it probably would have been a lot easier on her. But, um, yeah, I think it's just, you know, celebrating small victories and, and uh, incrementally just – and I really – I celebrate, you know, if someone does a good movement and – uh, it's it's really going in the right direction from a technical standpoint. I, I celebrate that as a coach. I don't need to see the shot go a certain distance. They may be consumed by that. Well, it didn't go anywhere. No, but, you know, there's a breakthrough there that just happened. You did what I asked. Um, now you, you got to feel it, repeat it, and these be, become your own. Um, so you can handle that under pressure situations. But you did the movement I asked. I said, we'll work out the timing on the finish. That's the kind of the last thing to come. But, I mean, if we don't get to a position you can throw from, it doesn't matter. So I think just – I think from that standpoint, under, understanding the movement, the process, and, and celebrating those victories and, and really starting to feel – you know, and I think investing is – being a student, student of the sport, um, she said if I made one mistake early on, when you were sending me videos, I probably didn't study them enough and really get a visual idea what they're about. I think over the last two years, she's really gotten better at, at studying some of the elite shot putters and studying, okay, what does Bedard mean by this? And how does that work for me? And how's this supposed to feel? So she's really put together the kinesthetic awareness with the, the visual input she's getting. And, but that's been her own growth and maturity, you know, and figuring out the sport. So, um, I don't know. Did I answer your question? I kind of went off on a tangent yeah, no. there. That's great. That's great advice. It's perfect. Coach, thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing this, this journey. I, I can't wait to see how you guys do once everything goes back to normal and you can get back out there and resume the journey. Dan, Roger, I appreciate what you guys do. I appreciate you having me um, visit and talk technique. And I, I really appreciate it. And uh, like I said, I, I value and appreciate uh, what you guys do. You know, I think part of my role, I've been doing this for 32 years. And um, part of my obligation as a coach is, is to give back to the track and field community. And that's why, you know, if I have high school coaches reach out and contact me and they want information on, you know, workouts or throwing or technique, I send them whatever I have. I have no – I said, be careful what you ask for. I got 32 years of stuff. I can I can uh, collapse your email, you know, by sending you too much stuff. But I um, I want to help out any way I can. And, and any time I'm doing summer or winter camps, um, coaches can come for free. I don't charge for, for coaches to come to my camps because it's – it's my way of giving back, and I, I, I want to do that. And um, I think that's part of what my you know track and field, as special as it is, there's a, there's definitely a share, a sharing of information and and technique. And I've had some mentors and coaches that have been really kind to me in the past, and helped bring me along as a coach. So I want to give back. Coach, thank you again. Thank you very much, Brian. All right, guys, take care. Great talking to you. Great talking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please check out McThrows.com for info regarding upcoming webinars. Thanks again, and have a great day.